Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks so much for joining us for The Well-Rounded Musician with Alexa Tarantino. Um, this is episode eight. Um, I can't believe we've been doing this for eight weeks, um, but we love having Alexa. Um, for those of you who are new to some of our master classes, my name is Chloe Jury Fogel. I'm the video editor here at Jazz and Lincoln Center, and I'm here to host the session tonight. Uh, today is very special. Alexa is joined by jazz drummer and educator Ulysses Owens Jr. Um, together, they'll discuss what it means to be a well-rounded musician and how they're making the most out of their time in quarantine. Uh, as usual, we'll then open it up to questions from all of you guys. Um, and when that time comes, we, uh, I will jump back in and explain how to ask a question. For the time being, feel free to shoot me a message here on Zoom or to use the comment section on Facebook. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can today. Um, that all being said, I will turn it over to Miss Alexa Tarantino um, and to Mr. Ulysses Owens Jr. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Chloe. Hi, everybody. Great to see you again. Happy Thursday. Welcome back to the Well-Rounded Musician. So um, I am in, again, yet another new spot. This is like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? But where in the world is Alexa Tarantino? Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm socially distanced, I'm safe. So that's all we need to know. Um, don't worry, <laughs> no flying happening. But um, I'm gonna, you know, we got the flowers here. We'll be working again to get back to the interior decor game. So I'm super excited to kind of turn over a new leaf with Well-Rounded Musician and start this new phase of bringing in guest artists. I just felt like you all had heard enough from me and it was time to get some new perspectives and to bring in some of my best friends, colleagues, mentors, and heroes. And um, this guest is all of those things for me. Uh, Ulysses Owens Jr., an amazing drummer, educator, music director, and just ambassador um, for jazz and for being a well-rounded musician. Um, I met Ulysses at the Juilliard School because he was my professor uh, in the small ensembles there. So we had a blast through that and I learned so much and I'm very fortunate to um, work with him in a couple of different settings in his big band and a new quintet that he has called Generation Y. And he's got a lot going on, so I wanna welcome him in. Hi, Ulysses. How are you doing, Alexa? Good, good to see you. You too, you too. Oh, I miss you, and I'm so glad you're doing well, and I'm glad you could make it. Um, and I know that everybody here is going to be so happy to hear from you. I'm honored to be on here, seriously. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, the past several weeks, I've just been sort of spilling all my tricks and tips and tools <laughs> in terms of um, being ready for anything that comes at you in creating a freelance jazz career. And I feel like you are one of those people um, from working with Christian McBride to Kurt Elling to Joey Alexander and then going on to just create your whole like whirlwind of projects as a band leader. Um, maybe you can just tell us what this quarantine has been like for you, just like maybe from the beginning, what you've been up to, how you're making the most of it. Sure. Um, so yeah, first I, I kind of will talk a little bit about being a well-rounded musician. Um, I think to your point, um, I feel like if you want to be a successful jazz musician or a successful creative artist, you have to really learn how to multitask and you have to really learn how to be essential, you know, which is to me so incredibly important these days. Um, because obviously those that are working right now are essential to society. And I think there are things as artists that we can do to kind of shift our art from a place of just being art for art's sake to really fulfilling an, an essential need. So um, you're right on it. When I saw that, uh, sort of advertising on jazz.org and saw that you were doing this, I thought it was really important because I think those that are gonna really sustain and make it in their careers are gonna be those that really figure out how to navigate their talent and again, put it in society. And even what Winton tells us, you know, I remember one time in a faculty meeting, he said, hey, if you really wanna make it, you gotta figure out how to take your instrument, stand in or, or sit in a room and transform the room. And then, you know, uh, by virtue of the, the world. So yeah, that's been incredibly important. In terms of quarantining, um, man, I started, I think about March 12th, I was actually on spring break and I was preparing to come to Florida and hang here for about a week and then go back to Juilliard. And I got the call that I had to stay in Florida or stay wherever I was. I was not even permitted to, to walk back in the building. And it was really unfortunate because, you know, we were right at that place where I feel like my ensemble, we were really gelling 
and we were kind of getting ready for some more concerts. And then I was getting ready to sort of send off, you know, three of my students into the real world. So I will tell you that um, I had to first figure out how do I reformat my curriculum? Because we now had, you know, a whole new set of guidelines um, and even accreditation rules that we had to kind of shift so that those that were pursuing their degree and finishing all of this stuff made sense and that it qualified, right? So that was really important. And then I would say it really made me a better teacher because I had to figure out how can I make my students feel my presence and also my commitment to them through a screen, you know? Um, so that was really interesting. And it, it allowed us to actually, to me, be better. All of us, I became a better teacher and educator and they became better students. I would also say I end up being in Florida and figuring out, okay, first of all, what do I do? Cause I had to stay in my house and you know, people like us, we're always like all over the world. We, I always say I have ADD. So like I, I'm driven by, you know, you know, being home for 24 to 48 hours and then leaving. And what was interesting was like to be home and be in a place where it was like, I didn't have to leave. And so it was like, well, what do you do now that you don't have to leave? So, you know, me for the first month or so, I rested a lot. Uh, I did a lot of writing. I had to finish up a couple book projects, but then I was like, all right, what else do I need? And then people were asking me for interviews and stuff. So I built a production studio here um, in my parents' place because I needed to be able to record. And so I started working on Pro Tools and learning that. So that was a big thing that I've been wanting to do for like 10, 15 years. And I finally had the time to do it. And then I would say after that, I started getting a lot of um, requests and inquiries from students on Instagram. Thanks to you, you uh, sent some students to me. So I think what this has taught me is, you know, we, our idea of being a jazz musician is being on the road and reaching people. Well, reaching people, it doesn't have to be confined to getting on a plane and being in a venue. And this has taught me how to figure out how to do that successfully. And it's made me grow other parts of my career. And I have to say, I'm so thankful that I've already been the kind of guy that multitask and really has multiple streams of income and believe in multiple ways of making it. Because when this happened, it made me say, okay, well now I'm just gonna focus more on these things, or I'm gonna focus more on that, as opposed to I know others may have been more challenging because they had nothing else but the road. So I think if, if, uh, you know, if there's nothing else anyone remembers, and God hopes, you know, I hope we never go through this again, but I think use this as a moment to cultivate other things that if, you know, whatever your main source of income is attacked or, or prohibited, you have other things that you can do. And I, I have to thank education. I think Winton, because watching Winton and all the ways that he's incredibly virtuosic has helped me. So anyway, those are some things that I've been working on. And um, I feel like things are getting a little bit back to normal now, because I actually have a summer camp going on with my kids that don't miss a beat which is my family's organization. So that's happening. Uh, so I'm with kids almost every day and that's kind of lifted my spirits a lot. Uh, but yeah, I'm having to have a new relationship with my instrument and with my craft and figuring out how to stay motivated. Um, so yeah, those, those are kind of some of the things that I'm doing these days. That's so great, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm really um, interested. I mean, I know a little bit about Don't Miss a Beat, but could you sure. tell our, our viewers sort of how that came to be and how you have balanced that with all your traveling pre-COVID. Sure, so Don't Miss a Beat was this idea that I had actually being at Juilliard, we had a chance to travel to San Jose, Costa Rica. And I remember we performed at a cultural center and at this cultural center, first of all, our performance was free and all of these families were together and they were bringing, you know, like little Tupperware dishes and, and they were just hanging and they were being uh, themselves and just having a vibe and we happened to be there performing for them. So it wasn't some, beautiful concert hall. It was like their home. And I always had in the back of my mind, I was like, man, I want to create that in Jacksonville. So um, years later, I graduated from Juilliard, broke like as ever, like, what am I going to do? So I decided to move to Jacksonville anyway, because I was like, I, I cannot afford New York rent. And while I was in Jacksonville, I started a music school. And uh, I said, okay, this is cool, but I don't really feel like I'm touching and reaching the kids that need me. I feel like I'm just reaching people who obviously want my talent or want my instruction, but I don't feel like I'm transforming a community and at that time there was a lot of crime which is still happening unfortunately but there was a lot of crime and a lot of it was statistically happening from children who were in high school they would drop out because of behavioral issues and then because or during the time they were sorry they was get suspended then when they were suspended and go back they were way out of you know uh they, they couldn't adjust in their classes or whatever right mm -hmm. so then they would drop out well statistically that was the demographic of students that was committing the crime so my family and I, who's full of educators and people in business and all that, we were like, I think we should start something. So I told them my vision 
and we started it. And so over 12 years ago, we uh, operated in, in, the, in the projects area of uh, Jacksonville, the Hollywood Book Projects. And I had 100 kids in a gymnasium, and the goal was to teach them music, dance, and drama. And at the end of the eight weeks, we performed an original musical. And during that time, there was no crime. All the stuff that was happening negatively, negatively in that neighborhood stopped. So the city said, what the heck did you do? <laughs> like, how did you do it? And we want you to pack up and go somewhere else and do it in another neighborhood. And so now here we are 12 years later, we have two community art centers. I have guests that fly in from all over the country, some the world, and we have an after school program and a, a music uh, art uh, summer camp intensive. And it's amazing. And you know, we have a lot of great partners. And um, I always say it's what makes my heart beat because it's one thing to play on a bandstand and you know, make people feel good in a club or a concert, but Something about that is very selfish to me because it's like, you know, look at me versus when I sit behind a desk or I go to a parent teacher meeting and help one of my children, I feel like that's my purpose. So it's really cool. In terms of balancing it, it's hard. I mean, I actually love the quarantine because it's given me a chance to really just be Mr. Owens, the educator and artistic director and really be there for the kids. And honestly, they really need me now. So uh, it's great. You have to really switch hats. You know, that word I brought up earlier about multitasking, like, you really do have to learn how to be able to give 100% of yourself in different things, but also compartmentalize. And I think the only way to run an organization is to have a great team, which I know you have that I've been part of your organization. You have to have a good team because you cannot do everything. So those are some of the you know keys that help me do what I do and what I love. That's amazing. That's, that's so cool to hear, especially because um, I think so many people view the stereotypical jazz life as somebody who is out all night, you know, playing at clubs, sleeping all day, and then just getting up and do it, doing it again, not necessarily the healthiest or um, the perhaps making a positive impact on the community in that way. And I actually read, I read something recently because, you know, Freddie Cole recently passed yeah. away and I was reading, um, it might have been maybe Elias Bailey's or, or Jay Sawyer, somebody wrote something that he had said, maybe Joel Fromm, I don't know, one of the guys in the band, said Freddie would say, um, show me a musician that sleeps till noon, which I mean, hey, we've all been there totally. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm not saying this is a bad right. thing, but he right. said something like, show me the musician that's always sleeping till noon and and show me, you know, to, is, to show me that is to show me somebody who doesn't have a gig because all the business has to happen in the morning. And mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's also sort of probably an old school statement as well, but I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are many of us that can sleep till noon and get all the business done. Right. But I just think what you're saying about compartmentalizing and having so many hats, it's so important to make time and manage your time. So do you have like a daily routine or even a morning routine that keeps you feeling energized, rested? Like it doesn't have to be music. I mean, do you meditate? Do you exercise? Yeah. What, what do you do? Well, I, I used to uh, go to the gym religiously until right now. <laughs> I'm a bit, I'm very nervous about being in the gym. Yeah. But I will say, yeah, I'm, I'm very big on getting up in the morning and having quiet time. I'm Anybody that knows me, as much as I'm a people guy, like I love people, I have to have a lot of quiet time. So I try to start my mornings very quiet and meditative. And then I try to have moments at night that's also quiet and meditative because I feel like what helps me to do all these different things is to always be clear. And I feel like the only way I can be clear is to have a lot of moments of stillness. So yeah, I get up in the morning. Um, I have a mantra that I sort of say to myself, you know, um, that kind of empowers me to like face the day, I meditate. And um, you know, like since I have the camp, you know, I try to drive, I have the windows down, taking in fresh air and just be clear before I, before I touch and interact with people. Because I feel like when you're cluttered and you're uh, a little bit just full of even what happened the day before, people meet that part of you. So that's a big thing for me. Um, I would also say too, a big thing is like really checking in with me and making sure I'm happy. Because I feel like, you know, being a jazz musician sometimes, and being on the road, you know this, you're kind of forced to ignore yourself. You're kind of forced to be like, oh yeah, I have a headache, but I got a gig tonight. Or, you know, this is going on with my family, but oh, don't worry, I got to be on tour. So you almost have to ignore your reality to face your reality, right? And so I really try to make sure I check in with Ulysses every day and just say, okay, dude, are you, are you happy? Like, are you cool? Like, are you, like, is everything good? And if, and if the, the answer is no, I kind of make mental notes of like, what's wrong? And is it something that someone else did or is it something I can do? So that's a big thing for me. And then I have a to-do list and I, have a, I actually just started using my alarms on my phone even more during the day 
because I, my schedule started getting really cluttered where even though I have a great calendar and I'm very diligent about my calendar, I had so much other stuff that was kind of slipping by. So I now do alarms as well in addition to my calendar so that I'm really on top of it. Um, and then every night before I go to bed, I look at what's going to happen the next day. I'm like, okay, what is, you know, what do I need to do? Is all that cool? And then I try to do weekly like uh, meetings with myself, like, okay, hey, what, what do I want to accomplish next week? What do I want to accomplish in the next two weeks? What about the next month? And even during quarantine, I did this. Like literally I had nothing at all, but, I, but for me, I don't do well with no structure. So even when everybody was just like the biggest event of their day was going to the grocery store. For me, it was like, okay, I'm going to go to the grocery store, then I'm going to come home and write this and do that. So I think for me, creating structure is what helps uh, me. But yeah, starting and ending my day with clarity and meditation is very key for me. So. That's great. Yeah, I really resonate with that as well. Um, and so uh, one question that I would get from the viewers of this show a lot, because I am always telling people about to-do lists or yeah. action items or productivity yeah. tips and tools. So do you, do you ever feel burnt out? What do you do if you get burnt out? And how, how do you keep yourself going through so many, through so many projects? I mean, even in quarantine, I feel like it's possible for yeah. freelance musicians like us just be, to be taking in all these, you know, virtual recording sessions, yeah. live streams like this. So how yeah. do you manage that? So the, the first thing that, um, that I try to do is I try to have a point where I stop. Right. Because I'm the kind of guy like I, I would burn out because I don't stop when I'm tired. I stop when I'm finished. Right. And so what that meant was that I would be up till three, four in the morning. But then what would happen is the next morning I was a mess. So what I do now, which I started doing it probably the last year and a half, I have a stopping point where I'm not take. I don't read any more emails. I don't you know, if it's a personal text, that's one thing or I'm on social media just doing, you know, scrolling on my friends, friends pages. That's one thing. But I try to stop my work stuff, you know, at a certain hour. And I'm just like, hey, if I didn't get to it today, I'm going to get to it tomorrow, unless it's something that's an emergency. Um, that really helped me to not burn out. So I think that's a real key thing um, in terms of just making sure that you're aware of your limits. And then I also think acknowledging like you can't do everything, you know. Um, and then again, just delegating and having a team like, you, you know, even though I'm nowhere near like a Winton, but I literally have a team, whether it's you know, someone to help with design for this or someone to help with, you know, assistance or someone to help with this. Don't miss a beat. I mean, I have a, I have a staff of like 30 people, you know, and, and so, so a lot of what I'm able to do is because I have teams of people that can make things happen for me. And I really try to make sure that they work with the same level of intensity and have the same love for what they do as well, because I'm only one person, you know, so mm -hmm. yeah, but I, I had to start building those stopping points because otherwise I was, I was killing myself. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. So do you have any advice um, for students that are either, you know, graduating in this crazy time or wanting to move to New York and be sure. professional musicians? What do you think in terms of like being well-rounded? Um, what types of skills would you look for if you were going to hire somebody for one of your bands? Sure. Um, I, I want to answer that. One thing I forgot in the last uh, question, you talked about how to manage to-do lists. I wanted to, to say, oh, yeah. I, I create different to-do lists, right? So there's actually a thing I have, it's called, I'm embarrassed to say, but it's called like a kill sheet. <laughs> and like, so like my kill sheet is like, literally like that has to happen today, right? Then there are things where it's like, all right, that can happen in a week or this can happen over time. So I think what creating like a, a, a sort of a, a execution or kill sheet for me was here are these like things that like you cannot avoid. And it was really great when I started being able to determine unavoidable things versus things that had time. Because when I was burning out, everything was like, I have to kill everything, I have to make everything happen. And it's like, no, no, you really don't. Like some things have to happen today and some things can wait. So I just wanted to, uh, help people realize that they can do the same with themselves um, is create sort of unavoidable and things that need to happen now and then long term. In terms of being well rounded and things that people need to do now, I think people need to understand first what are they great at. I think this is not the time to to try things out, and this is going to probably come across a little insensitive because I know like there's part of the world that says, "Oh, you can be anything you want." Yes, you can be it, but will you be successful at it? And for me, I'm in the place of my life where I want to only do things that I'm really, really good at. Now I have hobbies, right? I have things that I'm working on, like writing is a hobby for me. I, I you know, have my blogs, but that is not something that I make a living off of. 
right? What I make a living off of is being a drummer and being an educator. Same with you, right? You're an amazing saxophonist. You know, you also arrange and write and you're an amazing educator. So I think right now we need to really focus because I feel like before COVID, everybody, especially with social media, we were building these brands that had all these things that we were doing. And we, most of us didn't do all of that stuff well. So I think right now we need to focus on what am I great at? Because right now it's feast or famine. And then I think we have to really figure out what is our direction? Like, what is it that we want to do? And then that informs where we want to go. So I think right now is a time to really retool and reassess. But I think we have to lead with what we are undeniably great at and then go from there. Because I feel like if you don't do that, then you're going to literally slow down your process of being successful because you're almost putting in time in an area that's never going to get great. And I, I've, I've seen so many people do that. Like they'll, instead of, you know, really focusing on this, they also want to do this and something else. And I think you should only multitask once you have really mastered something, right? Like by the time you and I started running a camp or started running other things, we had already been to Juilliard. We had already gotten to a point where we had achieved a certain level of success and not even just success, but affirmation of our talent. And I find that a lot of this new generation, they're pursuing things and not even being affirmed. And then before they get affirmed and even get a level of mastery, they're moving on to something else. And even one of my friends just said to me the other day, she said, some, you know, she heard one of her students saying, yeah, I'm really worried about my brand. And she's like, would you just learn how to like be a dancer first before you worry about your brand? So I think to me, what I'd love to see us do is focus, focus on what we're great and also really get back to mastery, because I think that's going to be the real dividing line of those of us that are really able to like excel and those of us that just kind of meander or wander, you know? So yeah. that might sound harsh, but. <laughs> no, I, hey, I love it. You know me, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, sorry, um, and, you, and you did ask me, what do I look for? Um, yeah, I think yeah. what I look, I look for someone that is really, like for instance, when I met you, you were in my ensemble class and I never forget, even at where we go, where you went to school and where I teach, there are still levels of, of intense, uh, intense focus. And you were always focused, you were always on time, and then you also could really play. And then the other thing, and the reason why I hired you was you are a team player. So like you're a kind of person that no matter the different levels in the ensemble, like you're on a really high level of just how you play and how you operate, but you also can help others get to the next level. And I've always been a person that was never always the best guy in the band, but mm -hmm. I played with other people that got me to the next level. So I really like to build my bands in kind of a multi-tiered approach where everybody's great at something, but they may not be great at what other people are great at. So I would say I really look for somebody that can really play and then also connect their talent to the audience because I'm, I'm, I'm an audience guy. I want people to feel better when they leave my shows. So yeah, yeah. those are a couple of things that I, I look for. And then that, that spark, I want, I want everybody in my band, even with Gen Y, like everybody in the band, even though they all have very varying personalities, they all have something, <laughs> you, know, you know, they all have something really unique and they have something that it's special. So uh, those are some things I look for. No, that's that's so great. And I, I can't wait to get back on the road. Yes. With that band. Yes. Oh, gotta get those matching jumpsuits. So and face masks. No, I think, yeah, that's it's it's great to hear just like where you're at. And I'm sure that everyone who's in the that boat is feeling inspired. Um, so at Jazz at Lincoln Center this month, the the hot topic, the key word is freedom. Mm -hmm. And Winton and Jazz at Lincoln Center have been posting videos every day centering around this theme. And I know you have your project, Songs of Freedom, yeah. um, and the album came out a year ago? Yeah, yeah, over a year ago, yeah. So can you tell us about that and just what the inspiration was for the project, um, mm -hmm. how it's been received, what you're, what you're up to with it, and yeah. and yeah. Sure, I'll just, I'll speak, uh, you know, sort of quickly about it, only because I, I do want to say something about freedom. What I'll say about Songs of Freedom, Jazz and Lincoln Center actually provided the space for me to, to develop it. I always had this dream of doing something focusing on um, Abby Lincoln. And I always loved Nina Simone. And so when Jason O'Lane came to me and said, hey, we're doing a show that presents 100 years of song and we, we want you to take 1960s to at that time, it may have been 2015. And I was like, well, Jason, I wasn't even alive half of that, that time. So I'm, it was me and Riley Muherker. I'm like, first of all, Riley, like, Riley's a baby to me. He had the <laughs> 1900s to the 1950s and I had 1960s. I wasn't even born, I'm an 80s guy, right? So, so what I decided to do was again, focus. 
And I wanted to take an era and a decade that produced a level of artistry that inspired everything else that happened afterwards. So I decided to stay in the 60s. And so again, I thought about Abby, I thought about Nina. And during that time, which literally we're in the same time again, there was so much police brutality. There was so much um, lacking uh, uh, of justice, particularly for African-Americans. So I was like, all right, we're fighting for freedom. So I want to do Nina, Abby, and you know, with those two as angry and passionate. So I was like, I need to get somebody that's a little softer. So I focused on Joni Mitchell. So I basically wanted to take the three of their songbooks and careers and pick things around freedom. And so that's how Songs of Freedom was born. Um, the project at that time, its initial iteration featured Dee Dee Bridgewater, uh, Alicia Olatuja, Theo Blackman, and a great, great band. And I was honored, man. Um, and afterwards, Miles Weinstein, which you know, Miles mm -hmm. was in the audience and he said, Ulysses, I think we can turn this into a show. And probably two, three years later, we had a record uh, released in Japan and also all over the country. And we toured and it was, it was excellent. But what I want to say is that freedom is something that I think is being really redefined. Mm -hmm. um, I think before, especially as an African-American male, uh, freedom is, is first cultural, right? It's like, I want to be free as a black man. Well, what does that actually mean? And what I've been really unpacking myself is, is I want to first be free to be me, right? To be Ulysses. And so when someone looks at me, they see me, the personality and my story and my journey, and they don't immediately start making judgments about who I am. Um, right. And that is what I'm ultimately fighting for. And I think for Winton, at least the bit that I've had a chance to, you know, be around him and learn from him, that is what he really fights for and through the music, because I feel as a jazz musician, you're always given love for the freedom to express yourself through your instrument. But now we're getting to the point where it's like, well, we want your creativity, but we don't want you. And so I think it's really amazing that we're in an era where this new generation is like, you either take me or you don't get anything else. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm loving, I'm loving the fight. I think that we have to, the last thing I'll say, I think we have to fight uniquely. And I think all of us are, are, are called to fight in different ways. And we're also called to fight from different perspectives. So I'm hoping that as we're fighting for freedom as a human race, and then obviously as a black man, um, with this new Black Lives Matter movement, also politically, we're fighting for that. I hope that all of us find our lanes. And then also the last thing, because I'm seeing it a lot in the jazz community, I want us to understand we will not get freedom by attacking each other. Freedom, freedom, you know, first of all, that was how others got freedom, was that they did certain things to our race. I don't think attacking and shaming people is gonna be the way to get freedom. I think loving ourselves and then virtually loving others and educating others is how we're gonna get to a place of freedom and understanding that it's not gonna happen overnight. It is not. And I think if we are patient with ourselves and patient with society, yet with a, with a consistent agenda, then the idea of freedom, I think we'll, we'll be more unified in how we approach it and how we're able to experience it. So that's my little two cents <laughs> about it. Absolutely, I love it. Thank you for sharing. And Thank I'm you. totally with you. And um, it's, it's inspiring to hear what you have to say. And um, I'm sure we have a, a bunch of, of burning questions here, but I just want to add for anybody maybe who's just joining um, that this is, you know, well-rounded musician. And this is the first sort of uh, episode of the series highlighting guest artists. And we're just so grateful to have Ulysses here. And I think, Chloe, I'm guessing we have some questions. Are we, are we ready to open up? open the floodgates? Yeah, we can open it up. Um, let's, uh, so guys, um, like Alexis said, um, you're watching The Well-Rounded Musician. Um, if you're new to um, what we do here, we love hearing from you in person. Um, so if you're here in Zoom and wanna ask a question, please feel free to use that raise hand function. Um, if you hit the participants tab at the bottom of the screen and then hit the raise hand button, um, you'll pop up for me and I'll unmute you so you can ask Alexa or Ulysses a question. Um, okay, we have a first question. I believe you pronounced it Kieran. I could be wrong, but I think it's Kieran. Am I right? That's right. Yes, Kieran, uh, what's your question? Uh, sorry, I just want to say quickly, hi, um, Alexa, and hi, Ulysses. It's good to see that you're both doing okay. Um, my question, being a young musician in this current time, trying to work on your playing and trying to learn as many things as you can. Do you think that working on your online content creation skills is something that's a necessary thing to be working on during this time? Go ahead, Ulysses. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, well, first of all, it's kind of what I said earlier about uh, the branding thing, right? Like, I think if you're at a place in your career where 
you know, if you're already gigging and you feel like you're out there and you, you know, people are hiring you and you're professional, then I think you can, let's say, split it maybe 50-50, like try to develop your brand and your online content. But if you're at a place where you're still very basic and your fundamentals are playing, I think the online content creation needs to kind of play second fiddle because, you know, what you don't want to be is a person that's promoting mediocrity. So like, you know, if you can't play a bebop scale or if you can't really swing and really like hold it together, I think you need to spend more time on that. And maybe your, your content creation is around getting better as opposed to promoting yourself and you're not really ready because then everybody's seeing you and you really still got some ways to go. So, I, you know, if you're, you know, if you're base, if you're still in a basic place or fundamental place, I would probably do like 70, 30 or, you know, 80, 20 in terms of 80% focused on just getting better and being a better player. Because ultimately, once you're better, everybody's going to start seeking you out to work with you. Yeah, I, I, um, I agree. I think a lot of people are turning to social media maybe a little bit too much. Like I notice with myself that I can feel burned out so easily, even just from scrolling or whatever. So um, I try to use it as a tool for good. So if I'm, if I want to get some online content, I really try not to just like pick up my horn to create something for Instagram, but I try to pick up my horn, be in a practice session, be working on, you know, something over Stella by Starlight, whatever it is, and then say, okay, this is what I'm, this is a snapshot of what I'm working on today. And then use that as my, if I wanted to post something, it's not just coming up with things for the social media platform, but just trying to keep it as genuine and really focused on the music as possible, sort of like what Ulysses is saying. Um, thanks, Kieran. I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks, Kieran. Um, great. The next question comes from Bob. Hey, Bob. Hey, I had to unmute myself there. Hey, Hi, uh, Ulysses. How are What's you up, Bob? <laughs> I, I, am, I hope you love my perch high on the Whitney Art Museum tonight. It's right out of New York. But, um, seriously, though, I'm, I have no hopes of becoming a well-rounded musician since I uh, uh, fled this alto saxophone. Well, actually, I was evicted from the alto saxophone many years ago. But... I do have uh, something that I've encountered with so many uh, jazz artists that I know in terms of being well-rounded and almost all of them are deeply engaged with other aspects of the arts, whether that's visual art, painting, sculpture, uh, drama, uh, film, uh, literature, poetry, reading. Um, and I wondered if either of you could comment about um, what impacts those might have. I mentioned this because Clearly, when, when, when people are students and when they're young, you know, there's such a relentless intensity on focusing on your music. But more often than not, I encounter musicians, and this is true in my own profession in radio and in college teaching as well, that sometimes a, an extremely narrow-minded focus can lead to really being cut off and not being inspired by other things. So I'll, I'll be quiet now and let you guys comment if you have any. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, you. You got it. Man, man I, I love art. Like, I, I've gotten into it even more. Like, I have a mentor. He's a great uh, chef and art lover, Alexander Smalls. And um, I've been friends with him for probably four or five years. And he has helped me to start building my art collection, actually, you know, and uh, you know, sometimes I, I sit in front of a painting in my house and, and I get so much from those paintings or even how I design my, you know, my, the place, like, you know, things I put in there because I really believe in energy and I believe that art sends energy to you, not just music or not just, you know, the, uh, you know, uh, moving art, like, you know, dance and, and drama and all that. So absolutely. I, I mean, probably in the last two years, I've become really uh, driven by, by art. So yeah, I, man, I, I got to have art in some way all the time, 24 seven, so. Nice, yeah, and I think uh, I was, just, we were just sort of talking about some other artists earlier. I was mentioning um, Cecile McLaurin Salvant, who I just was speaking to on a live stream earlier today, and she's a perfect example of somebody who's into visual art and textiles and all of that stuff. And I, we asked her this question of, um, do you try to keep things separate or do you try to bring them all together? And um, I mean, she should really be saying this on me, but she'll, I'll, you know, pass it along. She was saying now she's really, she used to keep things separate and now she's trying to really try to let everything inform each other. And I think for me, um, I'm 
I'm sort of like with music and then education. And I, I'm not really like in the whole other visual art or, uh, you know, literature or writing poetry world. But now, especially in quarantine, I'm like, you know, out for a walk looking at the trees and I'm like, oh, I should, I should like write a piece of music about this. This is so nice. Like it's so peaceful. It's so calm. You know, there's all this inspiration that I think being busy in those other fields, you know, was kind of getting pushed to the side. So um, for anybody kind of in a mainstream and maybe with their blinders on, I think you can find inspiration to get involved in other avenues in, you know, it's, it could be right in front of you and you might not realize. Great. Thank you, Thanks. Bob. We appreciate you. We appreciate yeah, Bob. all you for us. Bob Absolutely. Is... Thanks for spending the music, man. I appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Thank you, Bob. We appreciate you. Thanks, Bob. All right. Our next question comes from someone you may know. This is a question from Warren Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking that question. No, <laughs> what up, people? Oh, <laughs> what is this? The oh, poet Swole. What's happening? <laughs> hey, I do have a serious question. I just, yeah, I'm yeah. just curious to know. So during this quarantine, we're talking about being an all around musician. What are you guys listening to? All, all around musicians should always be checking out multiple styles, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, just to make, bring out the full musicality of who you are or who the student may be. So um, how about that Warren Wolf Christmas record? <laughs> hey, I'm gonna tell you now. Wait till Fresh you dance the press, with the baby. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't, I haven't listened to it yet, but I will, I will, I will. No, it's coming. It's coming out in November. Oh, okay. I listened to your the one that you put out when I last saw you, though. Mm -hmm. And I like I that. that. Go ahead, you. Go ahead, you. What do you? Yeah. What do you? I, it's funny when he asked that. Um, we always did that on the road with. Uh, with McB, they always like, yo, what you listening to? So I'm looking through my recently added uh, things, and they're like random. So uh, Bigger Love by John Legend, his new record. Uh, Christian Sands uh, had some tracks released from his record. Um, there's a group, Iron and Wine, and checking them out. Uh, there's an album by, uh, it's called The Album by Tiana Taylor, uh, Beyonce Black Parade, Daniel Caesar's new record, Gregory Porter's thing. Um, Ambrose has a new record out uh, on the tender spot of every callous moment. Just checking that out. Michael Olatuja has a record like Lagos Pe Pepper Soup. And then I would say, man, I got this um, thing. I was thinking about Roy. I can never listen to enough Roy Hargrove. And I started going back and listening to a lot of his RH Factor records because mm -hmm. they're so amazing. So that's some of the stuff I've been checking out. Awesome. Um, my recently played is on uh, my thing's not happening on my phone. So I'm going from. <laughs> I'm actually, I've become obsessed with this band called Moonchild. I don't know. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah, I've become obsessed with Moonchild. Um, so, and that's, you know, not, not uh, your typical jazz situation. And also in quarantine, I um, got a record player. So some of the records in the rotation have been uh, Monk at Town Hall, um, uh, then Moonchild, I did get that on vinyl. And then I've been doing some woodwind doubling stuff lately. So I've been listening to my favorite German clarinetist. Her name's Sabine Meyer. And I have a bunch of her um, playing Mozart. So awesome. that's, um, I guess that's way different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's cool. You know, I just think, again, that's just all me. I just think it's, just, it's, it's cool to just always pick different styles of music and combine with what you're doing. I mean, I'm, there's so many artists that you can pick from. I mean, I think jazz is like the greatest music ever. And then you can actually pick different styles and combine them into something that you're doing compositionally. You know, you never know what could come out. Just the sky's the limit. But anyway, I just wanted to ask y'all that. I miss y'all too. I miss Bob, you too, I man. You on there, what's wait, happening. wait, what are you, what are you, what are you? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, what you listening to, Wolf? You Honestly, don't get out that easy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. I mean, it's, I've been listening to a lot, a lot of rock music. Really? Yes, but it's not like crazy rock. It's more like, to be honest, some of this music that in, in rock music, you know, it's it's tricky if you really zone into it. It's a lot of odd meters. It's actually a lot of chords that you can actually um, solo over. I mean, you can you'll probably hear F sus, you'll hear F major, you'll hear you know certain harmonies. Wow. It's just a lot of 
traditional jazz musicians would never think to play that because, you know, there's a certain feel behind it. But um, Thomas Pridgen has a group called The Memorials, based the tour five years ago. Um, that's mainly the one I'm listening to now. And uh, one more. There's a guy named Kiefer. Mm. Kiefer is this pianist who lives out in, uh, I guess he lives in L.A. I he's, he's doing all these hip-hop beats, but when you hear him play piano, I swear to you not, you would think it's probably Benny Green on piano. Wow. This dude is flowing easily. <laughs> Nothing but bebop patterns, but in a, in a hip-hop way. I don't mean like the other person in hip-hop that we all love. I'm not going to say his name on here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know. That's a whole other subject. But again, I got to go. Okay. Thank you, Wolf. I miss y'all. Bye. Miss, miss you, you too, man. See y'all soon. All right. See ya. Yeah, brother. See <laughs> Thanks, Warren. All right. Uh, let's take a question from Cynthia. Hey, Cynthia. Hello. I'm Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. Hey. I live in Seattle. Hi. I've really been digging your uh, webinars. They're on my calendar every Thursday night and uh, it's a great way to be learning and uh, staying inspired and it inspired me to be learning uh, autumn leaves and all 12 keys on saxophone and piano and so awesome. <laughs> awesome it's so good to see you again thanks Cynthia yeah this is a great webinar um, so along those lines um, I'm a I'm my day job now is as a marketing and communications manager at the Meany Center for Performing Arts. Mm -hmm. So we're a presenting organization at the University of Washington and we're pivoting since all of our events have been canceled. We're pivoting our con our, our content to online uh, content like presenting artists and and you know trying to find a way to stay relevant. So professionally and personally I'm trying to find a way to curate content uh, that's meaningful to me as an artist, to, you know, resources that I really like, um, organizations that have great organizations or content like Jazz at Lincoln Center, which is just, un it's like a gold mine. Um, so I'm just wondering if either of you or both of you have um, resources or go-to places that you love to for content like Berlin Philharmonic is awesome um, and and what if you pay for it if, if it's free and and if you have learning resources that you really dig or concert or you know like what sort of resources do you go to in quarantine online and not including social media <laughs> well I'm gonna <laughs> that to our featured guest uh, I well i mean it's interesting um you bring that question up cynthia i i kind of feel and this it's it may sound weird I, I really feel a little bit overwhelmed actually by so much of the content right now because i feel like everybody is trying to pivot and everybody's pivoting kind of in the same direction so um i've actually other outside of uh social media i really haven't been taking in any additional content because I, I feel a little bit overwhelmed and I kind of feel like everybody's like, look at this and look at that and check out this and check out that. So it's kind of hard to know what to, to look at. Um, I will say that I've obviously I love Jazz at Lincoln Center. I've done a few things recently with uh, Monterey Jazz Festival, um, Purdue Convocations. I really love Open Studio Network. I'm part of their artist roster. But what I love about it is I feel like they give things that really help musicians to get better and it's very targeted. So I would say the kind of things that I really love are, are really like, like targeted to like helping musicians. Or like the other day, there's a great Brazilian drummer, Rafael Barata, and he just posted the most, like coolest video the other day with him and Rosa, uh, Rosa, Rosa Passos, a uh, brilliant um, uh, Brazilian artist. And it was just the two of them like playing together. And I met, I was like in the grocery store, like checking that out. I couldn't stop watching it. So I think what, what I love is either stuff that helps you be a better musician or really unique performing um, opportunities that put together people that otherwise wouldn't come together. So that's the kind of stuff that really speaks to me or conversations with people that normally would never have the time to chat, but now all of a sudden they're, you know, like I saw Alexa's doing something coming up with like McBride and Winton and all these people. And I'm like, whoever can should get on that because a lot of those people, they're not even uh, available to do this kind of stuff. So. Those are the things that kind of speak to me content-wise. 
Yeah, um, I think during the quarantine, I've sort of been trying to revisit like reading real books, like actually holding a real book. Um, so like so somewhat similar to, to Ulysses, I guess. Um, like he said, like now that I'm home, I can look at all my books <laughs> organized by color and pick out what I want to read. Um, but in terms of like digesting, I guess, uh, music and, and content online, I mean, I've heard that the Berlin Phil is awesome. Um, obviously, Jazz at Lincoln Center. I think any of the small jazz clubs, um, you know, I know like Scholars is doing stuff like kind of from their living room. Um, Dizzy's, of course, is doing Smalls stuff like too. that. Smalls. So um, I guess that's where I would go. And the Vanguard is now starting to stream, I think, from inside the Vanguard. Um, so that's the type of stuff that I would probably be sharing. I'm, I, th I think I saw that Renee Fleming is doing something through the Kennedy Center on wellness, um, musician wellness. And, wow. um, so maybe not like, ac maybe actual like health, mental health, the kind of that type of a thing. So I flagged that. I was curious to check that out. So again, somebody who I would never probably be able to see speak in person. So I think I'm, I'm hoping to check out more of, you know, what the Kennedy Center has going on. Um, but yeah, there is just so much out there. And especially with everything going on outside of music, I think it can be hard to focus on, you know, on finding things that actually share and bring positivity. <laughs> but uh, I think it's great, if, you know, as much of that stuff as you can share and then just um, send the good vibes out to your people. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Cynthia. Good luck. See you next week. Yeah, see ya. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. All right, we got a question in the chat. Uh, this question is from Tanya Bell. Uh, <laughs> What's up, Tanya? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to you and you, Lexies, but I think, Alexa, you probably can speak to this as well. Um, I know that you have an incredible nonprofit down in Florida that keeps you busy during this shutdown but how are you managing to keep up that collaborative spirit with your fellow musicians at this time? Are there virtual sessions? How are you continuing to flex that muscle? You want to go first, Alexa? No, no, no. They should, they okay, you sure? Okay, cool. Yeah, um, to, to Tanya's point, yeah, it's funny. I have a, a group of musicians down here. They're quite a bit younger than me. Some of them teach actually at Don't Miss a Beat, um, but most of them go to like UNF. And uh, it's probably about five or six of them, some singers and you know, bass player, guitarists. And they've also been helping me learn how to record. But I've been working with them the past, I would say, few weeks. We've been kind of doing some sessions. And that has been really great because it's gotten me back into, like, just playing and, like, knowing what it's like to feed off of someone, you know, musically. So that's been really cool to start that process. And then, like, we'll, we'll play something. Or, like, even last night we had a demo session. And we put some stuff together. And then we listened to it together. And I find that that's helping me to stay connected um to just the collaborative spirit i've definitely been getting called and been sending like you know drum files to various groups i have some cool stuff coming out soon with some other bands um but yeah i definitely try to do that like where i'm working with you know these cats and they're young and they're really great because they've got new ideas and um they're pushing me around and you know making me check out new things so i've been i've been making time that way so. nice um Chloe, we can probably, if we have other questions, we can do, we can do kind of one and one before we yeah, end. Um, sure. We have a couple more. Um, this question's from James Hancock. Um, he asks, what are some good strategies for getting back into playing? I'm assuming that's meaning like if you haven't played in a while or uh, if you haven't played during this time. Hmm, okay. So Good strategies for getting back into saxophone playing or just playing music in general. Okay, sure. Um, I'll take that that one. Um, <clears throat> I guess it depends. Um, I would have to know more about your situation, but I would say just do it. <laughs> just dive into it. Um, and you know, Ulysses and I were talking about the importance of like routines and setting timers for yourself and things like that. So. I don't know, it's, it sounds like if you're just getting back into playing, you might kind of want to fall in love with the instrument again. So putting on those records that made you fall in love with it in the first place, 
um, playing along with, you know, the Omnibook solos from Charlie Parker, you know, playing along with Train or Cannonball or whoever, whoever it is that inspires you, starting to transcribe some of their solos. And then in terms of the literal, like, physical aspect of it, I would recommend, you know, small, small chunks in, until you um, start to get your endurance in terms of embouchure strength, long tones, overtones, scales, articulation, um, just slow and steady. Yeah. Good luck. Great. Thanks for your question, John. Um, or sorry, James. Um, okay, let's get another, we're back with Kieran. Let's ask get another question from Kieran. We don't usually allow two questions a session, but we'll make an exception for you. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate it. Um, I'll, I'll try to be very quick. So um, I never got the chance to ask you both this uh, when you played at Scholars back in January, but I wanted to get some advice um, for writing and arranging because, you know, I, I listened to works by both of you that night and just everything that I I got to witness and I got to hear, you know, it was some of the most beautiful music I've see, I've heard. And since I've been doing my studies at Berkeley, I've been getting into arranging a lot more in some of my personal projects. And I was wondering if you guys had any um, particular tips and things to work on in terms of you know, practicing writing arrangements or, you know, what's a really helpful thing in terms of writing? Take that one, Alexa. <laughs> um, uh, ooh, okay. So similarly to, you know, how I was talking about getting inspiration from anywhere, um, I think you can really, you can create a melody with just a couple of simple things. You know, you can pick three pitches. If you, I find that it's easier to improvise and create something when you have an actual restriction or parameter on what you're doing as, as opposed to, it's like when you go to a buffet and you have like seven types of chicken that you could eat, but if the menu just has like two different types of chicken, then I might be able to decide a little bit easier. So for me, I like to do um, some exercises, just either challenging myself to stick to a couple of pitches. Maybe I come up with those pitches from some other type of inspiration. Maybe I heard a rhythm, um, you know, going along with my like nature walk type thing. Maybe you hear a bird play a particular rhythm or sing a particular rhythm and you can take that and create something out of it. Um, maybe you're really like into this particular sound and um, you can try to take that in uh, the particular uh, chord or alteration or something and you can take that and stretch it a little bit. And I, and I think I work best, um, you know, not just sitting down and like writing for five hours, but sitting down and writing for like 20 minutes and just seeing what happens and leaving it and then revisiting it the next day, 20 minutes, seeing what happens. And then like, you know, after maybe a few of those sessions, I start to really get somewhere and then maybe I'll get deep into the zone of like not wanting to leave the piano for a little while. So I would just say small chunks, um, sometimes putting parameters on yourself can actually inspire more creativity than you'd think. Can, can I add to that, Alexa? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the experiences I, I had you talk first because I feel like you're an amazing arranger and you have you have the chops and the technique. I feel like what I learned, especially in a lot of other bands, was also check out a lot of music. You know, like I never forget, like when I was on the road a lot with McBride, like he was always listening to music and and he it then by virtue made us listen to a lot of music and we would sometimes listen to the same music together. And it'd be interesting because then we go to like a sound check or something and I do this with Gen Y after us listening together, then we'll come up with an arrangement. So I think sometimes arranging is yes, what all those things that Alexa said, but the other part of it is incredibly organic as well, where, you know, you're checking out Herbie or you're checking out, you know, NYDC or whomever. And then you're like, man, I really dig this. Man, let's try to put together an arrangement like that. You know, and, and I've seen that happen with a lot of bands and we've even done it in our yeah. short time with Gen Y, you know, sometimes after playing and then like being on the road and driving, we get to the bands and it's like, man, let's, let's sort of pull from that. So I think it's even more organic than like this kind of way of like, okay, I'm going to do this, which is good. You should have that. But the other part of it should just be, you need to take in a lot of music and the more music you take in that gives you ideas as well. So I just wanted to add the other side to yeah. kind of what Alexa said. Yeah, totally. Totally. I yeah. love it. Thank you, Kieran. Thanks, Kieran. Thank all right, we got two more questions I want to try to get to before we have to wrap things up as Great. we're getting to 10 p.m. This first question is in, from Trish. She says, I have a high school-aged daughter. She is a clarinet and sax player, and she would like to double. 
what advice do you have to prepare her for college? She likes composition and performance. Books, schools, or any other advice for her daughter, Lauren, to prepare her? Sure, awesome. Um, welcome and thanks for asking, Trish. So uh, if she, she plays clarinet and saxophone, then she should also probably pick up the flute. Um, saxophone and clarinet and flute are sort of just a trio these days in terms of what you would need to know as a working woodwind doubler. Um, there's a really great book by, for flute by Marcel Moyes, M-O-Y-S-E, first name Marcel, M-A-R-C-E-L, and the book is a French title, De la Sonorite, um, D-E-L-A-S-O-N-O-R-I-T-E. -E. And so I love that book uh, just in terms of getting your flute chops together, um, clarinet, um, the rose etudes are very important. Um, I would encourage her if she wants to play jazz, listen to jazz flute and clarinetists. Um, there are so many, Hubert Laws, Frank West are some great flutists, flautists, uh, jazz clarinetists. I mean, today there's Anat Cohen and all, you can go all the way back to Benny Goodman or Barney Bagard. Um, there's just such a wide range. So if she wants to dig into the different kind of eras of jazz styles, that would be also very effective in terms of just understanding the range of things and um, yeah, and you can also feel free to reach out to me um, if, with any other questions um, saxophone related. Great, there you go Trish and good luck Lauren. Um, all right, let's get a final question from our friend Les Rose. <laughs> Hi Les. Les. Les is our frequent flyer. Woo! Oh. Hey, hey there. Uh oh, I muted you and then you got muted again. And I, and I had such a great opening line. <laughs> you know, timing, timing is everything. Um, it's such a phenomenon, uh, what we're all going through um, in so many ways. And the phenomenon that I'm actually talking to all of you guys and Ulysses, I've seen you countless times on Smalls Live because I'm in California. And so that was my 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> nice. Happy hour. Nice. <laughs> uh, and uh, I hope to see you on the live streams. And I think that's great that uh, the Vanguard is going to get back into that. It's um, also a phenomenon how, uh, and Kieran brought this up about content. It's almost like everything we do is connect right now is connected to content. Like if I'm a teacher and now I have to teach a class, that class now has to go online, which means it's content. So we're completely tied to content. Whereas before we would be doing our projects, going to our gigs, doing our concerts, and then we get home. Oh, I better put some content on. It would have been two separate things. And now we're completely attached to it. So um, it's pretty amazing. And uh, I'm very inspired to hear uh, young people um, that you're working with. I would never have known that about you. You're one of my favorite drummers. And now that you're in the world that I've been in for 40 years, uh, music education, um, it's, it's so fantastic. And now seeing these young people as well, um, make it a calling. This education and playing has to be a calling now more than ever. Um, so that's, um, that's the contribution I would like to briefly say. I love it. Now I have a quick question, um, a little more nuts and bolts. Ulysses, I'm not sure where you're from. Alexa, I know you're a New Yorker. In the world of education, and especially on the heels of Essential Ellington, seeing these incredible players. So in your scope of where you're living, where are the kids in public school learning their basics? not of reading concert band that's you know more obvious but and even jazz band 
but where are they learning their basics of jazz improvisation? Because I know in my era, there was nothing. Uh, I had to seek out, fortunately, I was very fortunate to have some of the greatest teachers uh, in the world living in New York in the, in the 70s. Um, but now, where you see these great bands, but then what about everyone else? Where are they learning their basics of theory and improv uh, so they could be in the game with these kids that, you know, have tremendous uh, band programs and, uh, and resources? Mm -hmm. cool. Cool. I mean, well, I, I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, Les, and um, I, I will say that Jacksonville, Florida, though it's not known um, as much as New York or Boston or some other places as being a, a you know, great place for jazz, I actually grew up with a great jazz community here. Um, and just kind of to give you a little bit of the, the path, um, we have a great elementary school here uh, called MLK, which is obviously named, named after Martin Luther King Jr. And there's always been a great band director, and that's kind of where most of the students can learn, you know, the introduction to not even necessarily jazz, but kind of popular music. Then there's a middle school here called La Villa School of the Arts. And that is, I'm a, I'm a consultant there. And that is where students are introduced to a really great jazz band program. And then from there, they go to Douglas Anderson School of the Arts. So I would say that's the key thing. Now, I'm from Jacksonville, but in being from Jacksonville, my introduction was actually through the church, through the Pentecostal church. So I would say, particularly, you know, in the African-American tradition at home, uh, music is introduced and the improvis improvisational element is introduced through the church. So that's really key. So I think that for me would be uh, how I got exposed to it. And then obviously then I had a cousin say, hey, you know, check this Arsk Peterson record out or whatever. But uh, there's definitely a, a school uh, or a lineage of jazz being taught in different schools in Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a phenomenal uh, community and when it starts in elementary school now you have a fighting chance to yeah. really go go all the way and my my goal for my students was simply play in college mm -hmm. maybe not major in music but keep playing in college for the enrichment for the enrichment and absolutely. and many of them do go on well beyond absolutely thank you great thank you Thanks, Thanks, Awesome. All right, guys. So it's five after 10, which cool. um, unfortunately means we are over uh, cool. for the night. <laughs> um, I just want to thank Alexa and Ulysses for coordinating our shirt colors today. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Seriously. We called each other. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, uh, thank you to Ulysses for being part of this today. Thank you to Alexa for another wonderful week of the Well Rounded Musician. Um, thank you to all of you for being a part of the community. We always appreciate seeing you um, here on Zoom and also on Facebook. Um, next week, we'll, we'll have another class, another well episode of The Well-Rounded Musician. But a quick note is that we're changing the starting time of The Well-Rounded Musician. So it will no longer be 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. It will be an hour earlier. So that's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard time going forward. Um, so don't be late. Um, and uh, next week, Alexa will be in conversation with another musician to be announced. Um, and uh, besides all that, we still have um, things going on with Jazz Lincoln Center, um, free classes, performances, um, master classes, the like. Just keep up with us on our website, jazz.org, or on social media, Jazz at Lincoln Center on Facebook or jazz.org on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, if it's within your means tonight um, and you'd like to make a donation, you can do so at jazz.org slash donate. We are a nonprofit and this is a tricky time for all artists and nonprofits. Um, so if it's within your means, we appreciate any contributions. And to any who have contributed in the past, we're so, so grateful um, to have you guys with us on our side during all of this. Um, that all being said, thank you again. I'll turn it over to Alexis to say goodbye and we will see you next time. Bye everyone. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Chloe. Thank you, Ulysses. It was Thank so you. great to see you. Mwah. Good to you see like you, too. Thank see you. you. And, and Chloe, can you drop um, yeah. his, his website in there for anybody that wants to follow Ulysses and see the awesome stuff he's up to? Chloe has uh, Ulysses' link, and, and she has my link as well. Tomorrow yes. with my summer online jazz camp, we have Wynton Marsalis from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern time. 
doing a master class and you can actually catch it in any time zone. It'll be up streaming through the weekend. So that link is there to everyone. Grab it before the Zoom closes or if you're on Facebook, um, check it out and hope we can see you later. And Ulysses, again, just um, miss you and- Miss you too. Safe. You too. Thank you. Thanks Bye. for having me. Thanks everyone. Right, take, take care, care guys.